Discover prototypical track and turnouts with the Roadmaster Series from Oak Hill Model Railroad Track Supply. Proudly made in the United States, Oak Hill's handcrafted turnouts provide unparalleled detail and accuracy, giving your layout museum-quality track work at an affordable price. Whether fully built or in easy-to-assemble kit form, Roadmaster provides all the details of real track. Looking for a custom piece of track work? Oak Hill can help with custom turnouts, diamonds, crossings, and more. Check out all of their offerings on their website, ohrtracksupply.com. Hey, don't forget to submit your answer for the question of the month, our new feature where you get to be heard on Around the Layout. Our question this month, what commodity does your model railroad move the most of? Go to aroundthelayout.com backslash question and tell us what that commodity is, where it comes from, where it goes, and why. Answers must be received by July 22nd. So again, aroundthelayout.com backslash question. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Around the Layout, where model railroaders come to tell their story. My name is Ray Arnott. So glad you could join us. Well, it's not quite time to find out what's happening in model railroading. We're a little early in the month, but we got a little special here. And joining me to do that, of course, is our regular Tony Cook. Tony. Hey, Ray, how are you doing? Yes, this is, I would say, bar none, this is the news of the year. It is. A, a super exciting development for the hobby. So this is a very exciting show. Yeah, and what, what we're talking about here is Firecrown Media has purchased Kalmbach Media. And that includes Model Railroader, which is, I would say, the rolling stone of Model Railroad magazines, right? It's the one that's been around forever and layout owners have always dreamed of being on the cover of. And I think we're going to find out it's in good hands and with some good news regarding the future of that. But we're going to find out more from our guest, Craig Fuller, the CEO of Firecrown Media. Craig, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So, Craig, there's been a lot of talk since this announcement came out. I, how long has it been now? Has it been a month or yeah, so? Was, since, just at a month since the news went public? It was, uh, we announced it uh, May 1st. Wow. And literally, as, as does, it's it's interesting. And I think it's, I would say obsessive or fanaticism, but I guess really the right word to put on it is passion for their hobbies <laughs> and that people just immediately, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Oh, this is, you know, uh, it's a sudden big shakeup and it's exciting stuff though. I've heard a little bit. I've seen you on some other things talking about it. If you would tell us a little bit about, because from our end on railroading stuff, both prototype railroads and model railroading, we don't have the same, you know, you've got more of a background in other things that are transportation, but maybe not that we would instantly know or recognize the company. So who is Fire Crown Media? And, you know, what do you do? What do you do with or how did it get started? Yeah, so we're, we've been around for three years. So my background is I started a company in 2016 called Freight Waves, which is often called the Bloomberg of Freight. So we provide high frequency data and news and information that covers all aspects of logistics. So intermodal rail, bulk rail, trucking, air freight, ocean, et cetera. Uh, that's in our domain. And we happened through that business to build up a large media business. I fell in love with media, but I also happened to be a pilot. And uh, in 2021, I bought Flying Magazine, sort of my first entree into the magazine business and realized there was an opportunity to take legacy assets that had large, enthusiastic audiences uh, acquire them and then invest significantly in those businesses uh, because really what's happened is there's been a pretty significant generational shift between traditional magazines. The internet really you know created a lot of winners and losers and bifurcated the media business. And if you didn't make the investments in digital, you were sort of left behind. But what's happened is that you know some companies have gone full digital and that hasn't worked out. They've sort of left their magazine communities behind as well. And, and I think what we've realized is there's an opportunity to make investments in the print side of the business, but also in the digital side. So that's what we're planning to do. And we've made, uh, we own 50 some odd brands right now. I think we've done 20 something transactions, uh, but essentially we're buying enthusiast magazines and, uh, and then making significant investments in those portfolios. 
and it, it's an exciting thing to have happen. It can be a scary thing, too. I went through that. I've been editor of Model Railroad News for 14 years, and White River Productions acquired it about a year after I became editor. And now I also do Diesel Era for White River and HO Collector. The changes we went through there and then picking up the Karstens group of railroad model craftsmen and rail fan and I mean, White River, every time I turned around, suddenly was like, oh, and then we have this other new magazine. Mm -hmm. And it's like we went from, I think, when they first got Model Railroad News, we also had Passenger Train Journal and maybe Railroads Illustrated. And now it's like 10 magazines and all the historical society publications. But again, it takes that kind of infusion because like Carson's had kind of run aground. And I think that, as you say, everything has changed, but there is still... And I hear that even from younger guys. I love having the magazine. And it always throws me when it's somebody under 30 saying that, because I would think I would have to explain to them what a magazine is. Yet they're writing me saying, I love it when I get model road news in the mailbox. I sit down. I like paging through it. It's so different. But then there also, of course, are Internet people that are online all day, too. So, again, I think that there was that thought at first, everything's going to go digital. And as you say that, yeah, but no, and it's kind of a mix of things. It's not like anything's really going or changing. It's just evolving. And do you see that same thing that it's kind of, it's a different world, but it's kind of still the same. You're selling the same product. It's still hamburgers, fries, and shakes, just a little different. I don't, I don't know that I agree with that. It's the same product. Ultimately, you have to have a digital uh, orientation and the way you treat digital is completely different than the way you treat print. And so. I don't look at it. I almost look at it, if you want to use the analogy of hamburger, it's almost hamburger and steak. Like one, one, you know, there are different occasions for different types of products or experiences and uh, different business models entirely that you have to have uh, with one versus the other. And ultimately, that's where most publishers have, have sort of faltered is either they transitioned into digital and sort of forgot their print legacy and left it behind or didn't make the transition and got lapped by the internet. And ultimately, because of the evolution of technology and business models, um, you now have the opportunity to sort of go do both. And that's ultimately what we we have built at Firecrown is we're digital natives. We happen to own, you know, 40 some odd magazines at this point, but we understand the importance of investing in print. Uh, but we also know what it takes to succeed in digital. When you guys looked at Callback Media before you purchased them, what were some of the really attractive parts of that magazine and that operation that really pulled you towards wanting to uh, bring this into the Friar Crown family? Yeah, ultimately, everyone, you know, we know going into a conversation with a company, whether we want to, you know, this is whether we can see ourselves owning this asset or not. So we're not, you know, we look at about one, I think about five deals a week, you know, a deal a day. Probably 90% of those transactions, just we pass on them on the first look. So if you sort of back into, uh, we're doing about a deal a month, you know, if we're looking at 20 deals a month, you could see that our batting average is about 5%. And so we, we have a, a pretty low, a pretty high threshold of what we look for. And the ultimately, the first decision that we look at is, do we, does the audience care about the content? And is this an audience that we can build around? And so ultimately, that's our first decision. And then, you know, ultimately, once we've sort of determined that this is a community that cares deeply about the content... And certainly Comback represented that. Then the next question is, well, what, what can we do? How are we the advantage buyer in this? In other words, like, what is it that we see about the opportunity that perhaps was not invested in or the previous owner did not see? And that's really the decision, sort of the second decision we make, because we want an advantage when we buy something. You know, we certainly don't want it to continue on the same trajectory. Even if it's on the upper trajectory, we want to, we want to scale that up. But oftentimes when you're buying legacy assets, it's not the case where you're buying things that have, you know, are growing substantial 10, 20 percent month over month type type scenarios. These are businesses that typically need some investment. And so that's what we then want to know is, OK, what's the playbook for this particular asset and how can we how can we make it something that the audience and the community will really love? But also, how do we get a, you know, a, a good return on those on those investments? And so those are the things that we typically underwrite. We look at the team, we look at the operations, we look at areas of where they excel, where we don't. One of those areas, frankly, is subscription operations. You know, Comback was 90% revenue came from subscriptions. Advertising was you know, such a small percent of the overall business model. Uh, and it's the opposite for most of our other brands, where it's 90% advertising, subscriptions are a very small piece of it. So we saw some opportunities to bring the Comback subscription team throughout the rest of our brands 
and really take over uh, that part of our operation, which we've done. And then vice versa, we we saw an opportunity to take our significant commercial operations and sort of orientation and put it into sort of that combat system and, and to these titles. And then last, you know, we have a very significant digital infrastructure that that is built as a platform that's very advanced. Uh, and we felt like we could bring a lot of value to to the combat titles. I was going to say eight titles being moved over there. You have magazines in the topics of aviation, marine, space, and as you mentioned, freight waves in the supply chain. So it seems like these titles are sliding over into a, a nice structure that's going to be able to help support that. Do you move team members around? Do you kind of bring that in and then have those assets move towards that target? Or are they kind of running independently with a little help? How does that kind of structure up? Yeah, we run what we call a matrix organization. So typically, if you think about like ad operations, uh, subscription acquisition, the stuff that it takes to sort of make the business work, that doesn't, it's not something that the consumer or the audience sees. So the consumer only sees a very small fraction of the overall business. They see the editorial and the creative products. Right. And so the, what they're identifying as the business is oftentimes the editorial team or the creative teams. They don't see all of the other stuff that it takes to run a successful media business in the background. Um, and so what we typically do is we take the best of the best resources. So if we acquire a business and they have people that we think are you know, better than our own or perhaps can complement our own team, we will put those folks in place and, and res, uh, be responsible for those functions. And then we see areas where we can leverage what we have in terms of existing operations and really level up a brand or, or put significant investments in it. And that's what we're doing. So specifically as it relates to Combat, you know, I talked about subscription operations. They have a very strong ad or a very strong operations team that's managing consumer cons subscriptions, ad audience development, things like that. We actually put them, made them responsible for our entire uh, subscription and audience operations across our titles. Obviously, you're not touching the editorial team. Typically, on editorial, you want those folks that are that are writing content about their specific subject matter expertise or their, their things they care about, and we keep those in place. But then all the other stuff, we end up bringing in uh, resources from across the organization. So, an example of that is uh, you know, we have a very strong technology team technology development uh, that's going to develop new websites, mobile apps, digital media experiences, even uh, some AI uh, built into some of that, some data mining. We will layer that into the combat titles to, to really bring some substantial improvements to the experience that consumers see. You talked about making some of these changes, but if you're a regular reader of Kallenbach titles or purchasing those, like I buy a lot of the soft cover publications in addition to the magazines, what's the thing to be looking for? Yeah, so two two different sort of strategies. One is digital, one is print, as I've talked about. And we treat them very separately. Um, I think the mistake that you typically see in publishing and media is that companies either are print oriented and everything, you know, the old uh, sort of adage that, you know, every everybody looking for a hammer, a hammer is always looking for a nail. And that's what print folks tend to do is they treat everything as a nail. Like we're print and every every decision we make is sort of orientated on our print product. And then you have the opposite in digital where everything is oriented to digital. And they sort of ignore the print or what I call bleed it out is they make it such a poor, like a really uh, product that nobody wants to buy that eventually they lose their audience. And so you almost have to to parse them separately and they have their own timescales. And so you have their own strategies and timescales. Print actually takes longer to innovate than digital because digital, you can do an enormous amount of testing. We do a lot of what we call AB testing, which is we can launch something new into the product, test it, see how the audience reacts to it. And then use that data to sort of inform the rest of our decisions. You can deploy that pretty quickly. Digital is incredibly easy to work with in terms of because you can move very fast. Print, on the other hand, requires a lot of decisions that have to be made. You know, once you settle on a print decision, you're talking about paper stock, you're talking about cover stock, you're talking about formatting. You're making a lot of decisions that, frankly, you can't reverse once it's in print. You can reverse in generations, but what we found is that audiences you know, they want stability in print. That's one of the things that print offers them is consistency and stability. Those decisions take a lot longer to make. Uh, I've already gotten notes from members of the audience who, 
you know, two weeks after we acquired it is like, why did you change the paper stock? I'm like, oh, we had nothing to do with that. Like, I, <laughs> those decisions, uh, that paper was printed well before we acquired it. And so there's a perception, I think, oftentimes that, that things are going to change overnight. And print just doesn't allow you to do that. And because it's very expensive, both in terms of, of the actual cost of printing, but also the fact that oftentimes the decisions are, are hard to reverse, you've got to be very methodical and take your time with print. So when we look at print specifically, you're not going to see a lot of changes in the ne- over the next year. It's going to be about a 12-month transition. So when we, if we were talking in a year from now, that's probably when you'll st- we'll start to talk about some of the new product rollouts and some of the new enhancements and the quality uh, increases that are will be born, new design layout that's... Um, uh, that that we will have planned. Uh, we'll be able to talk in more substance on brown print here in about a year. I will tell you on digital, the process is already underway. You know, the forums, we have already are migrating to a whole new forum platform. The forums were built on a very old piece of technology that, that created a lot of issues. We have a whole new forum uh, technology. We've already migrated the content. We're in a testing process. So hopefully within a m- next month, you'll see a whole new... F- experience the same content all of the historical libraries and archives will be there but you'll have a a brand new sort of experience an enhanced experience a much more stable platform moving things to the cloud which means transferring the data into something that's fairly robust and built on a sort of a newer layer of technology and that's best practice you know hard the problem with physical servers is that you're you're dealing with all sorts of like maintenance problems that you end up with. The great thing with the cloud is that it gives you infinite scalability uh, and agility that you just don't get with traditional sort of uh, computer servers. And so we'll, we'll make those transitions. Uh, you'll see a new, what we call UX, which is the user experience. You know, the current websites, whether you're talking trains.com or all the derivative sites out of that, are just very hard to navigate, hard to find something. They're just not great uh, websites in terms of the experience. And we will make those upgrades uh, and enhancements over the next couple of months. So those that's where I would expect to see the first or the audience would experience the first set of changes. And then over the next year, they should start to see those in print. I definitely can see the value of what you talked about before the magazine and, you know, Tony and I have talked about generational differences between each other where I'm slightly younger, not a whole lot younger, just slightly younger than Tony, where Tony likes that physical magazine and there's a lot of people that like to touch, feel the paper and in fact, that will even grade the paper as you, you mentioned. But for me, I love the, 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 the ability to take information and model railroader will just focus on just model railroader itself is a wealth of information over a massive amount of years that's been collected about the hobby. But to find it in paper, you'd have to have hours to dig through and know where was that article? What was the ability? And, and it sounds like that may be the move, right, to coming from a data background that you have to be able to take and search for that kind of material within Model Railroader, to be able to pull up information. Hey, if you're working looking for a specific topic, to be able to drill down and find that digitally would be absolutely outstanding. I mean, it's just it's a wealth of information. That's right. And that's really the the opportunity that we look at when we look at legacy magazines is you're buying, you know, in the case of, of the combat titles have been around since 1938. I mean, you're buying uh, these titles that are, all, you know, we're talking, you know, 80, 90 years old that you've got this enormous amount of wealth of content. You know, we have a title Yachting Magazine and been around since 1907. I mean, mm-hmm. talking about these magazines that have survived, you know, the combat titles survived World War II. I've like multiple depressions and recessions that have, uh, or multiple, re- the Great Depression and recessions. Yeah. Some of those uh, recessions felt like depressions to people, but <laughs> yeah. you've had this sort of, you know, you, you've had this long legacy and generational lots of legacy that that these print magazines offer you, and some of these very rich libraries of content that frankly have to be updated in terms of easy to find. So that is the opportunity when we go buy a magazine is we're buying all this history. Of, of content and opinion and reviews and a substance that has been around for many decades. And frankly, because magazine publishers typically haven't, we're not very good at sort of accessing the internet or sort of leaning into the internet. And that, in fact, many magazine publishers fought the internet for years and thought they were sort of selling out or this was a fad uh, until it sort of, it wasn't and it, it caught up to them. And the nice thing is that we can lean into that. And so 
the way I view print is that print is an experience in itself. Print, what's great about print is that you get lost in the content. You can read an article, you can look at a, at a photo and your feed is not constantly interrupting you. The problem is like, right now I'm looking at my emails. I have 32, in one, I have two email boxes. Uh, right now I have 32,361 unread emails in one of my <laughs> inboxes. I have 63,609 unread emails in another inbox. Uh, and so you think about that is, and I'm probably getting a thousand plus emails a day. I mean, that, that's not an exaggeration. That's like a real deal. And so the issue is like, I am getting inundated with content on a consistent basis. And this is not just me, it's everybody. You know, yeah. you have Slack channels. If you're, if you've got some type of messaging, internal messaging system that's firing up, you've got Twitter or X, you've got Instagram, you've got YouTube, you have all this content is being inundated. And the problem is our brains have not evolved to be able to take all that in or consume it. And so we end up wanting content that's really, really quick and really sort of, I just want the, I just want the facts, ma'am, right? Like, I just want the, I don't want all of the stories. I want the facts. And that's the way our brains are sort of taught yeah. uh, on a digital experience. And, but if you're looking at wanting history, that's the great thing about digital is it can archive, you can get data from it. That's what makes it so powerful. You get all of this history. The problem is that if you don't create an experience that makes it easy to find, it's sort of useless. It's like tapping into all of this content is the opportunity with digital. In print, the opportunity is to build an experience where someone's getting lost in the content. It's a journey when you read print. It's like reading a physical book. It's like, I want to read a book and I don't, I'm not looking for a bunch of distractions. I'm looking to zone out and sort of be lost in the content. And that's what print can can do for you in ways that digital just can't. And so we want to lean into both of those strategies. And that's effectively what we're going to do. Do you see the current tools you mentioned like Instagram and TikTok and Facebook? There's so many things. I always feel like there's something else to keep up with. Like I've got a YouTube channel on the side that I do for products and, and things. It, are all those tools you would use or do you want to, when you talked about creating and doing more things on your end digitally, are these exclusive things are using platforms and tools that already exist or both? We do both. So if we think about YouTube, specifically YouTube is a fantastic search engine for video content. It's also a very robust engine for hosting content. So, you know, one of the things that, you know, it's interesting how transformative YouTube is to the entire media landscape is it democratizes content. It makes it easy to find on almost any niche or subject matter. And I find myself on the weekends just watching these YouTube own like specific shows, shows built for YouTube on the big screen uh, in my house because it, I can get, you know, you can watch 20 minutes on this sort of documentary about some obscure. I was watching one a couple of days ago about these Japanese knives that were like, these are knives are like, ten thousand dollars but they have all so all of this stuff and it's just fascinating um and if you're interested in model railroading or aviation you have folks like yourself but all these subject matter experts that are able to sort of get into it so youtube is a really important part of our strategy we have a a, a team of a, in digital tv broadcast that's about 20 folks and that that means that what you would expect from that is streaming content live virtual events that are uh, sort of live archive content on YouTube, regularly produced content and shows. That's what we'll lean into for YouTube. When you talk about like other platforms like Instagram and TikTok, those are very visual platforms. Instagram sort of experiences lends itself to sort of short form video uh, and photography. And then TikTok is really, you know, really short burst of content, even shorter than Instagram. And what tends to do really well is very provocative kind of ta hot takes, if you will. And we have a strategy for each of those platforms. Some were better than others, you know. So we will do that. I'm a prolific Twitter user. I probably tweet 20 times a day, 30, 40 times a day. Active, we'll call it. So we will lean into all those strategies. LinkedIn is something you shouldn't forget for B2B audiences. But then we also have a substantial tech stack of our own where we will make investments on our own platforms and our own technology that we're not relying upon the what we call platforms. And so we we do all of that. You have to, I think. You don't have to be everywhere, but there is a, a an enormous amount of missed opportunity 
if you're not on some of those platforms. And that's what we will end up doing. We have strategies and conversations about each of those. Some content is better form uh, content for different types of groups and audiences and platforms. And, you know, our goal is to understand how those platforms work and how we can best uh, sort of build content for the algorithms. Because it's ultimately, when you're talking about platforms, that's ultimately what you're doing is you're building content for an algorithm. And when you're talking about your own tech stack, is you have the opportunity to sort of build your own algorithms, if you will, and build your own technology and your own experiences. And that, that's why we can create, have a, a bi-directional strategy for both is we can t- put stuff in the benefits from the sort of social uh, layer algos. And then we can put stuff on our own platforms that is effectively our own systems and experiences. Yeah, kind of in more simpler terms, uh, at least for me, is you're able to mold the platforms around the content versus molding the content around the the available platforms and kind of customize it and set it up for uh, a more uh, simpler way to digest that content. I think you have to do both, frankly, because I think you're, there are certain types of content that does exceptionally well on X uh, as an example. So this is, uh, and there's certain types of content that does ex- really well on TikTok. I mean, TikTok is a, a remarkably interesting platform. I don't necessarily believe all of the sort of content stats. You know, we'll, we'll post a piece on TikTok and in the 15 seconds, you have 3 million views. Uh, let, let they come from it. And I'm like, I don't know. This does seem highly suspicious to me <laughs> because in the other platforms, you may get 30,000 or 60,000 views. And so, um, but having said that, what it does is it, it it's sort of a social layer of the consumer conversation. And so, the, but those are areas that we will lead into and we'll build We'll build systems and technology and, and content that is built for the platforms, but also take existing content that we already have and position it so that it does well on those platforms. I think one of the fun things about whether it's the streaming like Facebook, YouTube, things like that, and it seemed to ex- it exploded during the pandemic with, well, this show got canceled. So, you know, I would have hobby shops and manufacturers that still wanted those opportunities and more and more of these streaming events got started and I thought they were tremendous and thought boy I hope as the pandemic goes down this doesn't go away this is something we should have always been doing there's nothing new about this why were we not all doing this and the thing I liked is the personal connection with the end user the manufacturer you know like myself you talked about the importance of like your editorial team I think that there is an access that you don't have or didn't have before with print. Like you knew those names, you knew those people, but you didn't really. And I find like emails, you know, conversations and things, I get a lot more feedback from those kind of appearances. And I think those are positive things. You've got a great editorial team right now. And I think, did I hear, is everyone moving? You're Tennessee based. Is that correct? Yeah. Nobody's moving physically. Nobody's. Oh, okay. The editorial team, we, we have an office uh, that is not yet open, but will be in outside of you know, Milwaukee. So mm-hmm. in that whole Milwaukee area. So we, we've, we've got an office specifically for combat. We're not requiring any move, uh, anyone to move. We're a work from anywhere uh, business, uh, which was different than combat. They did require some in-person uh, experience. Uh, we don't require that which enables the team to be freer to move around and do things that they want to do and perhaps travel to more events and be involved in the content. But it's ultimately up to them. There is a physical office if they decide they want to go in. But ultimately, we're not requiring anybody to move. Like I said, there are pieces of Combat's existing business that, frankly, as a consumer of content, you wouldn't experience. Uh, Subscription Operations is a great example of that, that uh, we thought their team was, frankly, better than ours. And, And we decided to make them that team our team. And that's ultimately how we look at each of our acquisitions is how do we take what they're really good at and we're not so good at and make it a part of it. One thing I would point out, because we've spent a lot of time talking about sort of the business model that we've got to a degree, is that scale really matters in media businesses. And the reason it matters is when we talk about leaning into digital and print, you have to have scale to do that because you can't run. And this is the reason I think a lot of publishers sort of have to pick they're either in print or they're in digital because if you don't have substantial amount of scale, it's hard to make the investments that you need to be successful at those business at those platforms. And so, scale does matter, and that's one of the advantages of being a part of Fire Crown versus being a part of Combat. Is we're a much larger organization, and we have a lot of resources that we can sort of throw at these individual sort of tasks and issues, so that uh, Combat and the titles can be relevant on any platform it's on. 
looking at all these other titles that you have, and you're certainly not new to the, the, the obviously the, the hobby side of things. There's a lot of hobbies that are listed in these uh, current publications. Would you say that your your acquisition of, of model railroading magazines puts that like in the, the, the smaller of the niche that you have? I wouldn't say it's smaller. I mean, if you look at the sort of breakdown in terms of percent of revenue, the rail part of our business is actually the largest segment. So it's about 27% of the revenue that we get is in, in rail. Uh, we call it rail. I think combat called it the tracks group. I prefer rail. It's just easier <laughs> on the street to describe what that is just to, to a consumer. If you say tracks, they're like, what is that? And I didn't know what it meant the first time. So we call it the rail group at fire ground. And ultimately that was, you know, it's 27% of our revenue. Um, our Marine and boating portfolio is about 25%. Aviation is uh, around, I think it's 20, gosh, it's more than that. I think it's around 16%. Uh, and then we have supply chain and astronomy that sort of make up the balance of it. So, but, but ultimately the rail uh, and, and fine scale, which is not, it's more of a, we, we, the hobby side of, of the business, if you will, is that 27%. I don't know. I think, I think it's in a good home because I'm looking through these titles and it, it's funny how you talk to model railroaders and you know a lot of them are also at least another hobby that all fit yes. within these categories. Oh, I, yeah. I enjoy aviation. I don't fly. I got a, I got a, my part 107. So that's as close to a pilot's license as I have. And it still doesn't get me free drinks at the bar at the airport either. But, <laughs> uh, but you know, space junkies. I mean, guys that uh, love trains, love space. So there's a lot of guys that have that that uh, very diverse. So I think it's in a good home. It's it's within a lot of the different things that we also enjoy outside of model railroading. Yeah, it's transportation. I mean, ultimately, all of our titles, uh, with the exception of maybe fine scale, is a is a trans. You know, model railroading. Yeah, obviously is not hauling freight or hauling people, but it's still connected to a form of transportation. The reason the hobby exists is because there's a love of a mode of transportation. And and I think ultimately that's an area that we are incredibly well positioned. If you think about it, we're the largest supply chain publisher in the world with freight waves. We're the largest aviation portfolio in the world with flying and all the titles associated with aviation. We're the largest publisher now, uh, the largest publisher of marine and boating. And and now rel and then you add astronomy. I mean, ultimately rockets. I mean, space commercialization is a supply chain problem. It's a logistics problem, and so most people don't think of it that way. And astronomy is much broader than that. It's about sort of the love of a stargazing or space exploration or space science. That's still built into uh, some form of movement or exploration, and that's built into us as you know, a lot of our audiences are men. It's not to suggest that women don't like don't like trains or don't like planes. It's just as a demographic, generally, these are men, these are sort of male-oriented uh, communities. And, you know, the demographics show that in the data. You know, as a, this is what, I, as a young boy, what I was playing with was cars and trucks and planes. I mean, this is all built into us. I've got five kids. I've got a, a set of uh, twin girls and then the rest of them are boys. You know, my boys are gravitating towards things that move. And and I think this is all built into that uh, idea. And so that is an area of, of sort of commonality in, into what we do. And I think we understand our audiences incredibly well. If I bought a gardening magazine, I wouldn't know what to do with it. But <laughs> but I, I do know what to do with trains and I do know what to do with planes. And and I think that's a that's an important element. One other thing that I think is an opportunity that we haven't discussed, and this may be less important for the for your listeners, but it's something I'll touch on, is that we also understand B2B. I mean, Combat was predominantly a consumer enthusiast publication. There's, there's absolutely importance to that. Most of our publications, frankly, are. Um, but we also happen to understand B2B very well. And um, we have some plans to, to really take trains and trains.com and really boost some of the news and sort of the business intelligence that can come along with it. There's a portion of the audience that's not in the um, rail industry that will actually care about that content because they want to know what's happening across the industry and how the regulators are impacting it or potentially what the economic models of these businesses are. And we, we will be able to lean into that as well. And I think that was always to me like Don Phillips uh, column from Washington DC that he used to do in trains that was part of trains that I enjoyed 
because I didn't have access to railway age or progressive rail because mm-hmm. I didn't work for a railroad. So you do, I would see them at, you know, swap meets, that kind of thing. So I knew those existed, but those industry publications where they talk some of the nuts and bolts, where it's not just the oohs and ahs over train stuff, but that kind of financial or business in, I, I find that very interesting. And so that's exciting to see some of that for trains, I think would be great. One thing I wanted to ask, but and we're listening to this, so we don't get the the same thing that Ray and I are getting to Craig's office. I see his posters for flying magazine. I see his truck and there's airplanes back on his shelves and he's wearing a Southern Pacific daylight shirt. So we've got about everything represented here, but Craig, we haven't asked, you talked a little bit a minute ago about as a kid, the stuff you played with in that. So what obviously transportation, you have that same bug as a lot of us do. And again, as, as, as Ray mentioned, I think we all have sub hobbies. For me, it's cars. You know, if you can talk to me about trains for a while, but then, hey, let's talk about Fords and Lincolns or this or that, that I like to talk about automobiles. Uh, what is your personal interest? Or I mean, obviously, it's a transportation thing because that's what you're doing, or I hope so, doing what you like to do. But give us a little bit about who is this new guy that's going to be taking a new direction for these magazines we love. Yeah, so I'm like, I, I am a pilot, uh, which was why I bought Flying Magazine to begin with, is sort of a passion project. But I'm also a freight nerd. I know that seems weird, and but maybe the audience here can relate because we all like transportation. You know, my weekends consist of, if I sort of look at off time, I mean, I'm working, it's probably not an exaggeration, 18 hour days, seven days a week. And, and look, I, I have multiple hats and I run multiple businesses and people ask, how do you split your time? And I don't know how to define that. I don't run a 40 hour week. To me, being in the business, whether we're talking railroading or aviation or, or supply chain, it, to me, this is what I would be reading about anyways or studying. So I get to participate in my passion projects as my career and build b- my business around it. I have the the freedom to do that. And I think that is, so these, these are my hobbies. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a consistent learner. I, I'm always have an enormous amount of intellectual curiosity. I gravitate towards story, historical sort of figures, stories of, of uh, sort of biographies of historical figures or businesses I love business drama. Like there's a great podcast called Business Wars, which sort of takes these. Do you guys know this podcast, by the way? I highly recommend it. I Um, don't know, but I'm going to check it out because yeah, I love books on that kind of stuff. So wow. Business Wars? Yeah, it's called Business Wars and it takes two competing businesses. Usually there's an incumbent and there's a like a disruptor or an inner like has joined the business. It's intentionally time to take it down. So good example of that is like Nike and Adidas or, you know, Boeing Airbus. I think, you know, Chick-fil-A versus KFC. So they they get into all of these. You know, one of them was Taylor Swift versus Scooter Braun. So they, <laughs> they fend two competing forces together, usually founders. And they talk about the business, sort of the drama associated with it. I absolutely love that because as a, as a business founder, as an entrepreneur, I sort of can relate with a lot of the emotion and the stories that go into these uh, there. I think about railroading. Who would be the business, like, who would you guys nominate for the business wars of railroading? Well, you have, I mean, obviously comes to mind like the the one of my favorite books, and he's a former column by contributors, Fred Fraley's Blue Streak Merchandise on the SP stuff. And it talked about the Krebs and like Haverty, the people that worked with Santa Fe and Southern Pacific. I knew Mike Haverty from, I did public affairs for Union Station in Kansas City for many years. And those guys all, I mean, they have fascinating careers. And you open a railroad history book and you're reading about them. Uh, I just finished rereading a Rio Grande history book from that I hadn't read in many years. And there's always things you pick up and different people you come away with. Oh, I'd forgotten this guy was also involved in this deal that I mean, it, it's the ultimate soap. Forget Dallas or Dynasty. Follow business that that's yeah. what, which is what those shows were anywhere about business. But I, yeah, I, I love that. Yeah. Are the class ones now too clubby to really have a, a diehard war? Or would you consider the Canadian railroads? The Kansas City merger is the business yeah. war of who was going to win that one. I, I would, I'll just say this, and then there's certainly a lot of battles that could be fought within the class ones. But I know there are railroad fans out there that treat railroads like sports teams. Like mm-hmm. there is just yeah. absolutely like, you know, there's rabid Dallas Cowboys fans and there are rabid 
CSX fans or rabid UP fans yeah. or rabid. So you wouldn't even have to contact the businesses. Just get two model railroaders and put them in a room and let them fight it out because yeah. they, they'll fight on behalf of them all day long, all day long and, 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 and fly the flag high for them. No matter what you say about their mm-hmm. railroad. Do we need to have like a, uh, a, like a tournament of UP versus BN versus, yes. C, you know, yeah. Yeah, like a sweet yeah. 16 mm-hmm. of them, right? Yeah. Put them all and in like, a, who, yeah, who would come the greatest railroad and, and uh, so yeah. like class one. Yeah. Oh, that could get uh, that, that would could be get very bloody. Maybe we should do that. <laughs> that is. I don't know. <laughs> Once we get our website updated, maybe we'll do like that. A, is a yeah. that a is a fun thing. Yes. Uh, yeah. Let the, let the community vote on greatest railroad because uh, yeah. that would be fun. I mean, yeah. those yeah. are the types of things that I think digital could do really well. Mm-hmm. Is invo- you know user generated content UGC, um, which is that you know voting and participating in the conversation is something that digital does really well. Magazines will do that very well, frankly. Is like yeah. you send a letter to the editor and it may get published. That's not as much fun as actually writing uh, mm-hmm. content. But then, but then you have the other side of it is you get a lot of people post stuff that you have a lot of trolls that also uh, yeah. enjoy oh, doing yeah. that, um, yeah. which yeah. is always an interesting. As a public figure, you get a lot of I get a lot of the a, a lot of the shade <laughs> talk, and it's okay. And one of the what this kind of leads me to, and you, we talk about the word. You know, I, I kind of said rabid, but the word I really meant to use was passionate. And we have in our hobby, a lot of passionate people and they're passionate, not only for the hobby, but the, the outlets that cover it as well. And I'm sure you've learned this and I'm sure that you have it in all the other hobbies as well. They're just passionate people, passionate about aviation, passionate about space or passionate about boating or fishing. And with that comes this passion. And again, with, we'll go back to model railroader and kind of the, the, the big question and the big concern that people had about Model Railroader leading up to this acquisition was that they were seeing that magazine shrinking. It was 90 pages, then it was 80 pages and 70, down to the mid 60s. And and I think that concerned a lot of people and hearing it being bought, I think their fear because of that passion was that that magazine was going to go to zero. And it sounds like quite the opposite is going to happen for Model Railroader. Yeah, I mean, the thing about having a media business, whether we're talking magazines or digital websites or even large social media accounts, is that ultimately there's a lot of opinion. You know, we, there's a saying in media circles, uh, uh, because everybody has, I can name a couple of media businesses and you're going to have a you know, really positive or really negative reaction based on, on who I'm talking about. The thing about media is you don't want to be boring. And I, I think there's a there is a an element of if you start to bore your audiences, they're not going to care and they tune out. And so having opinion is actually a good thing. Even even some strongly passionate opinions that maybe are uh, can be on the offensive side is okay, frankly, because it. And I'm not talking about the publisher. I'm actually talking about the audience. That's okay because it shows that there's a depth of care. They actually mm-hmm. care about the content. I think what. What I would read is that there was almost a level of dis- of disappointment, and in the fact that um, the perception in the community is that Combat did not care about the content, and I saw it in the employee base when we met them. But I also talked to a number of folks in the community that deeply care about the titles. These titles meant something to them, and they expected the the publisher to step up. Like, what are you doing? Like, why are you letting this thing die on a vine? Kind of perception. And I think we have a responsibility to sort of ignite some passion in that. It does take a while. It's not overnight. Um, there is a business model. One of the things that when we sort of made these first investments with Flying Magazine was it was going down the same path. Cheap paper, you know, it went from 160 pages to like 50 pages or 60 pages. The paper was really thin. The covers were really thin. The, the, the print was sort of drowned out. And I think one of the things we did was we made significant investments uh, in the quality of the print, where you get a much higher quality of publication with much beautiful, much more beautiful photography and paper, and people started to send me letters, not attacking like I can't believe you're doing this, but like, are you okay? Like, are you going to be in business? Like, <laughs> why are you like why are you doing these things? Almost like there was this belief that you can't be beautiful and you can't be high quality in print and still make money, and I think that's wrong. And so. Our job is to sort of stand up the publication um, and make those investments. And and hopefully the community will be sending those, you know, questioning the sanity of its owners, not because we've done bad things, but because it looks as if we're spending a lot of money on a business that they may question. And the reason I say that is we're, we're a very profitable business. We're growing incredibly quickly. 
we do have a lot of belief and conviction to our business model. We've got a lot of capital available to us. So we know that those investments, we will get a return, but we want the audience thinking that they're getting more than their share value uh, than what we're putting into it. And that's, and that's exactly where it's at, seeing the value in that magazine subscription and, and getting uh, a magazine that honors the beauty of our hobby, like you've talked about, a magazine that lives up to that standard, which is phenomenal. And it sounds like, uh, I don't know about you, Tony, but it sounds like Model Railroader and Trains and all those publications that we love are, are in good hands. I'm really excited about it because I the same things that Craig had talked about. It was at train shows, emails, whatever. And again, I have nothing to do with that. But I'm sure, you know, it's like, why is Pepsi doing this? Well, I work for Coke or, you know, I don't know why you're asking me. But I would hear those things. And yes, and I felt the same thing because, again, I grew up with all those magazines. Love them all. And so, yeah, I was excited to see this change, this new energy coming into it. I think from what I've seen, what I've heard, I think Craig Fuller and this team is going to do some amazing things. And I'm excited by it. It all raises everything, you know, in our business that whether it's, you know, manufacturers, hobby shops, magazines, better products like this and what they're doing with the Kallenbach titles overall the the level rises and i'm excited craig congratulations on getting this and i'm i'm very excited to see what happens i appreciate it i mean one thing i would say i just want to sort of closing thoughts on this is like there is a belief and like it's backed by some data that younger people don't like magazines but there's also new data that we're seeing in new generations that grew up completely digital natives they grew up in the where iphones were already out you know, this is the 2008, some, you know, I have teenagers. They actually really like print. There's sort of this old vinyl element coming into it. People yeah. buying Tara Swift records and vinyl. There is a, there is a younger generation that looks at print almost as more innovative because it's tangible. It's not digital. And I think there's a lot of conversations about AI and, and deep fakes and stuff, but there's something authentic about a magazine that is real. And you, if you know who the writers are, and this is one of the things about digital is that you can actually, your, your contributors and your writers can be a personality uh, and accessible to the audiences. And that's something we can do. But I would say that I, like, I am very bullish on print, but I think the, the print business is incredibly strong. And I think AI and all of the sort of stuff that's happened in media is going to make print that much more tangible. And I think we're going to see younger generations. Uh, we discover that if not already. You know, it's funny when you say that, Craig, what I think of on that is with Diesel Era and like our rail fan and railroad publications, guys can, you can go shoot pictures of a train, come home, pull out the SD card, put it on Facebook online instantly. And there you did it. Yet I always see someone saying, I got my picture in Diesel Era. Look, they printed this like it's not real until it's in print. Like I, I will see these where they open a magazine. Oh, I got my article in this magazine or, oh, look, they did this or that. So again, as you say, there is, it's a different animal. It is. And I think over the next decade with an AI specifically making it so easy to produce content and distribute content that over the next decade, print's going to become a luxury good and it's going to become a premium item. And I think you're going to see a fallout of publishers that have not figured out how to sort of navigate those issues uh, and other publishers that have that are ha, are thriving in that world. And I think hopefully we are making the right investments, which, you know, we believe that we are and uh, we will be one of those that actually ends up thriving. So we're, but again, these, this journey is a is a while. Like, I know I'm going to get messages in a month. be like, well, you told us. <laughs> or improvements to print and they're not there. Yeah. It's going to take about a year before the consumers will experience those uh, changes to print. But you should start seeing some significant improvements to uh, the website within the next three months. And one thing I'll say on AI, because it's just a conversation media circles that's really big, is I'm not a believer that, that original content should be AI driven, but I do think AI is a fantastically efficient search engine. Ray, you were talking about archiving content. Is yeah. We've reached an AI. Uh, We've reached a period in time where the technology is so good that if you wanted to find some very some search engine technology is so good, 
we, we rolled out an AI layer on Freightways.com, which only reads our content. So it's we, we can trust the content that's being produced. And what it does is if I ask it a question, it's a chat bot. It basically will serve up an answer using referencing our content, which is I think is a really powerful tool. And you'll start to see that hit the uh, combat title soon. Again, not we won't never we'll never use AI to create original content. It'll be human driven. But I think for indexing, for searching, for making things easy to find, uh, AI is, is certainly coming. Oh, it's certainly a powerful tool for sure. And uh, certainly nothing to be overly afraid of. I, I use it for ideas. It's, a, it's certainly a booster for ideas. And I've thrown some things into it and, you know, taken from that and created. So it's really bad at subject matter expertise and these like niche, uh, you know, whether we're talking supply chain or talking rail, it doesn't know those things. It just doesn't do a good job of that. What it is really good at is if you have a, a set of specific parameters around it, and you can build AI engines that we're doing, like I said, we have one with Freightways.com right now, where it only is reading our content. So we trust that our content has been properly edited, properly fact-checked. That's where AI is incredibly powerful because it can, it can, like you said, can come up with ideas. It can take some really obscure facts and make them easy to sort of find and discover. Um, my son uses it for, you know, uses it for, for ideas and topics and papers. Uh, we use it uh, for media, for doing advertisements in some of our e-commerce businesses. So it's a really powerful tool, but it's sort of like Excel for accountants. Like it's not going to destroy the account. Excel did not destroy, destroy the accountants. They live inside of it. And AI is not going to destroy media. It's going to be an enablement tool. So before uh, before we let you go, speaking of websites, where do we? It's going to stay the same. Trains dot com. What? Correct. We're, yeah. Not we're, not that not that most of Ray's listeners don't know this, but <laughs> let's throw out those places to go to start looking. Because again, as I say, I think this is definitely a time to be looking if you haven't subscribed recently. That kind of thing. That there are changes coming, and you want to be there as it's happening. So where do you go to find out more? Yeah, trains.com is the is the domain that has all of the tr the rail titles from the combat uh, group that will still stay the same. Over time, hopefully within a couple of months, you'll see some improvements to the UI and UX. I personally don't like the current experience. Uh, and so we'll be making some significant uh, updates there. But that's where you would, if, if you're interested in rail, that's where you would see uh, those uh, changes. Uh, and then our rest of our titles, you can go to firecrown.com to learn about the rest of our titles. And if you want to reach me directly, X or Twitter is the best way to reach me. I'm at Freight Alley. And I, I have a I respond to quite a few messages that I get sent uh, directly. Um, so feel free to engage with me on X. Uh, I'm accessible there. Well, awesome. Craig, thank you so much for coming on Around the Layout and telling us all about what's going on with Fire Crown and all of our beloved magazines. And again, they're in good hands. So thank you for taking good care of them. Ray, Tony, appreciate you guys having me. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Around the Layout. Learn more about today's episode, check out past shows, and much more on our website, aroundthelayout.com. Show your support by becoming an operating crew member at aroundthelayout.com slash crew. Follow us on social media, aroundthelayout.com slash social. And send us your feedback, aroundthelayout at gmail.com. Thanks for hanging out with us, Around the Layout. <laughs>